All right, if you're there in <clears throat> Acts chapter 8. So tonight's uh, message tonight is going to be more of a, a Bible study uh, lesson here in Acts chapter 8. It's uh, really loaded with a lot of material, even just the book in general. The book of Acts is, is short for actions, and it's uh, a lot going on in these chapters. And um, right here is one of my favorite chapters. So I just really want to go verse by verse. And it's a lot of good material in here to teach. Uh, as we go through, we got a lot of dialogue going on, a lot of conversations going on between people. And uh, with that, I want to stop and make some little sub points with these uh, that we can apply to our life. And with that being said, let's just uh, begin to move forward. If you pick up uh, with me in verse one, the Bible says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. And at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. And they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the apostles. So beginning in verse one, it says, and Saul was consenting unto his death. So obviously, because we're jumping in chapter eight, you know, a lot has gone on already. So we have to ask the question, well, who for one is this guy that's being put to death? And this man, Saul, is consenting to his death. Now, of course, this Saul is talking about later on who will be known as Paul, the apostle Paul. But right now, he has not had that Damascus Road, you know, intervention with Christ. And right now he's known as Saul. He's a persecutor. And we're going to get into that in a second. But it said that Saul was consenting unto his death. Well, who is his death? Well, this is talking about Stephen. And if you back up with me uh, to Stephen, let's go to chapter six. And this man, Stephen, he's brought up in chapter six of Acts. Acts chapter six, if you look at verse one, it says, and in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplied, there arose a murmuring of the Grecians against the Hebrews because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Then the twelve called the multitude of, of the disciples unto them and said, it is not reason that we should leave the word of God and serve tables. Wherefore, brethren, look ye out among you seven men of honest report, full of the Holy Ghost and wisdom whom we may appoint over this business but we will give ourselves continually to prayer and to the ministry of the word and the same pleased the whole multitude and they chose Stephen a man full of faith and of the Holy Ghost and Philip and Prochorus and Nicanor and Timon and Parmenas and Nicholas a proselyte of Antioch so there's 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 this issue going on in this early church and what happens is, is that the apostles don't want to leave off from preaching the word of God and and tending to that word to start, you know, this uh, this menial task of making sure that everybody have, you know, what they supposed to have with these widows and everything. And not that they should be overlooked. They just don't want to be charged with this business. So they look out some men who have already been following them, some men who have already been, you know, pretty um pretty uh, solid on doctrine and full of the Holy Ghost. And they choose one of the uh, seven men that are chosen is Stephen. OK, and this man, Stephen, who I believe was an apostle. And we're going to get to that soon that I believe Stephen was an apostle. If you look at verse eight in chapter six, it says, and Stephen, full of faith and power, did great wonders and miracles among the people. So this man, Stephen, was one who was put to death. We started off in verse one in Acts chapter eight, and it says Saul was consenting unto his death. If you look at chapter seven, chapter seven here is preceded by chapter eight. And if you, if you look at verse 58, it said, and cast him out of the city. This is talking about Stephen. And it said, and stoned him. And the witnesses laid down their clothes at a young man's feet, whose name was Saul. And they stoned Stephen, calling upon God and saying, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. And he kneeled down and cried with a loud voice, Lord, lay not this sin to their charge. And when he had said this, he fell asleep. So this is when it says in verse one here, and Saul was consenting unto his death. Well, that man is Stephen. And Stephen did great wonders. He preached the whole chapter seven. It's a long sermon where he basically takes them throughout the whole history of Israel. And he's saying, listen, all this was leading up to our savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course they didn't like that type of preaching. So they end up putting this man Stephen to death. And the main one who was consenting to it was verse one, where we had in Acts chapter eight, Saul. Okay, so Saul here, 
uh, is consenting unto his death. And uh, the remainder of that verse says, and at that time, there was a great persecution against the church, which was at Jerusalem. So right here in verse one there, this here kicks off a lot when it comes to preaching the gospel around the world, because this here, a lot of um, I would say this is very historical events when it comes to the early church, the persecution of Stephen. This is what really kicks it off. And then in verse one here, Saul is consenting unto the death. And then there's a persecution that raises up against the church. And what happened is it said, and they were all scattered abroad throughout the regions of Judea and Samaria, except the, uh, except the apostles. So the second event that we can look at is that this great persecution against the church. And basically who is leading, who is the ringleader of the persecution is Saul. If you look at verse two, it says, and devout men carry Stephen to his burial and made great lamentation over him. As for Saul, he made havoc of the church, entering into every house and hauling men and women, committed them to prison. So if you look at that last verse, you see Saul, we seen him in, in, in verse one, he is basically consenting to the death of Stephen. Then here in verse three, he's making havoc of the church. Saul here is basically working up the persecution. He's the ringleader. He is making sure all this goes forward. And actually, when he changes his name and he's known as Paul, he begins to chronicle some of these events that he did, you know, in his former life. If you turn with me to First uh, Timothy chapter one. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, he writes a letter to Timothy, and in this letter, he speaks about his former days. You know, most people call it your B.C. days, your before Christ days, right? So he talks about his B.C. days. Look at uh, verse 12 in 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It says, And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Notice verse 13 who was before a blasphemer and a persecutor and injurious, but I obtained mercy because I did it ignorantly in unbelief. So he talks about, hey, my former life. He said, I was a blasphemer. I was a persecutor. Well, did not we see that in chapter eight of Acts? He's persecuting the church. He's causing havoc in the church. He's hauling men and women to prison, those who believe on Christ. And then he says, injurious. What is that? You causing bodily harm. You're injuring people as well. Turn with me to Acts chapter 26. Acts chapter 26, verse 9 through 11, he's here, uh, he's basically giving a testimony to King Agrippa. And he speaks about his B.C. days, his before Christ days. He's even telling King Agrippa how he was before he got saved. Look at verse 9 through 11. He says, I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. I mean, did you hear that? Paul was saying, this is how I thought in my former life. He's basically saying, I sat around just thinking, how can I persecute Christ? Right. That's literally what he just said. I verily thought with myself that I ought to do many things contrary to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. Then verse 10, which thing I also did. So not only did he think about it, he said, I'm, I'm actually going to do this. Verse 10, which thing I also did in Jerusalem and many of the saints did I shut up in prison, having received authority from the chief priests. And when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them. Sound familiar? How he's consenting to the death of, Saul, uh, of Stephen. He says, and I and when they were put to death, I gave my voice against them and I punished them oft in every synagogue and compelled them to blaspheme. He's compelling them to blas blaspheme the Lord Jesus Christ. And being exceedingly mad against them, I persecuted them even unto strange cities. I mean, Paul was just a terror. Well, Saul, I would say, excuse me. Acts 22, turn with me to Acts 22. He makes another statement in verse 18. 
the Lord Jesus Christ uh, in verse 18, it says, and saw him saying unto me, Paul is saying, I saw the Lord Jesus Christ. He's saying he was speaking unto me. He said, and saw him saying unto me, make haste and get thee quickly out of Jerusalem, for they will not receive thy testimony concerning me. And I said, Lord, they know that I am prison and beat in every synagogue them that believed on thee. And when the blood of the mar of thy martyr Stephen was shed, I also was standing by and consenting unto his death and kept the raiment of them that slew him. I mean, even here, he's just saying, yeah. I, I, I told them to go do it. I held the coats, the coats of the men. So this is go back to Acts chapter eight with me. This is very heavy when it comes to the history of this first century church. You know, this newly established church. And in Acts chapter eight, verse three, it says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church. So we just seen some of the havoc. Those previous scriptures. This just shows the havoc that he was causing. He's causing bodily injury. He's. Uh, basically compelling them to blaspheme. He's sitting around thinking, how can I persecute Jesus? And he's hauling men and women in prison. I mean, just imagine Paul just kicking in your door. Saul at this hand, kicking in your door and hauling you off to prison. And this is really, you know, as verse three says, as for Saul, he made havoc of the church entering into every house. Just imagine, like I said, just coming into your house and picking you up. Hey, get him. Take him off as well. It says in hauling men and women committed them to prison. Verse four says, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. So we also see how this great persecution caused a scattering as well. Uh, this early church, it was a church that grew mighty fast. It grew really fast. I mean, you can recall, uh, what is it, uh, Acts chapter 2, the day of Pentecost. The Holy Ghost come upon uh, these 120 people that are there, and basically they began to preach the gospel in many different languages to the people that were there, right? And what happens is a lot of people get saved, and guess what? Those that were there for that time, they can now take the gospel back to their land. But also just the people in Jerusalem, a lot of people got saved during that time. What about Acts chapter two, verse 41? It, you don't have to turn there, but it says, then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3000 souls. So just that day, 3000 souls added to this church here in Jerusalem. Acts chapter five, verse 14. And believers were the more added to the Lord, multitudes, both of men and women. So we see this early church and that was in Acts chapter two and then Acts chapter five. Acts eight haven't came yet. No persecution has come yet. The church is just growing. Right. And as I mentioned, there's this persecution that comes upon the church. And this persecution causes a scattering of the people. And we know what the persecution was like. We just seen. Paul, we don't need to go back through that, but we see what the persecution was, you know, hauling people into prison, causing the blaspheme, uh, you know, causing bodily injury and everything like that. So that's what that persecution was like. And notice what they did when they were persecuted. The Bible says in verse four, therefore, they that were scattered abroad went everywhere preaching the word. I mean, think about that. They were persecuted. And then they were scattered, but not only just scattered, while they were scattered, they decided to start preaching the word of God. Amen. And, you know, I think that's a good lesson as to how you should handle persecution, how to handle adversity. Because once a persecution come upon us, what's the first thing a person do? Well, they make it all about them. They, you know, get on Facebook or, or start to talk to people. Whoa, it's me, man. I'm really going through a heavy time right now. And they put all the focus on them. But what should really happen is, happen is that you should take the focus off of you and put it on someone else. And that's how we see that they handled the persecution. It said they went everywhere preaching a word. It ought to been, you would think that if they were persecuted, they will go off and hide somewhere. No, they were persecuted, but then showing up at people's door saying, hey, you know, have your sins been forgiven or so? So the thing is that we can learn that that's a good way to respond to adversity. Take the focus off you and put it on someone else. And that's really kind of difficult because 
when you're being persecuted, it's hard to think about someone else. It's, it's hard to just say, you know, I, it's even hard to get up and want to do some things. You know, you just want to sit around and just woe is me. Right. And then what? How does the world handle adversity? The world says, well, you know, maybe you should try yoga. Maybe you should try, you know, a therapist or so. Maybe you should turn to drugs, you know, just get a drink. Let's go out for a drink, you know, and maybe all this will go away. Let's, you know, let's let's go for a smoke or so. So they look for uh, let's play your favorite music and maybe that will help the adversity go away. Notice that they make it all about them. But no, how about when adversity come, put the focus on someone else, take it off of you. And put it on someone else. And I think the fact that uh, the Bible says that there uh, came a great persecution. I kind of, me personally, I think about the last days when a, a great persecution is going to come, right? And I think this is a good uh, picture of what's going to happen in those days. I don't think the people of God is just going to go hiding somewhere. I think they're going to do great exploits. I think they're going to still be getting people saved. I don't think saved people are going to be running and cowardly down and being a coward. So, no, they're going to preach the word of God just like these people did. I, that's just my opinion. I believe that many people are still going to get saved during the time of tribulation. So the thing is, uh, there was a scattering and and them being scattered was the will of God. The will of God was for these people to get scattered. The persecution, the tribulation that came on the church, that was the will of God. Second Timothy three twelve says, yea, and all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. So the question is, well, why are they scattered? Because here's the thing. You think about this. Many people were saved right during this time. But guess what? A lot of people were getting saved in Jerusalem. A lot of people were believing on the Messiah in Jerusalem. But the thing was, was it God's will that only people in Jerusalem get saved? It was not God's will that they only get saved, that salvation get preached only in Jerusalem. It was God's will that it gets preached not only in Jerusalem, but Judea and Samaria and then unto the uttermost parts of the earth. Acts chapter one, verse eight says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost has come upon you and ye shall be witnesses unto me both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So God basically uses this persecution to basically scatter them abroad. Because think about it, if there was no persecution, what would have happened? They would have stayed there in Jerusalem. So God had to basically, the way I look at it, light a fire up on them to basically start getting this gospel out of this one region and get it across the globe. So this was God's will that this persecution basically drives them and scatter them. And what did they do? They saw to do the will of God. They went everywhere preaching the word of God. Let's pick up in verse uh, five. The Bible says, then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So notice the Bible says here. It, it, it basically introduces another character. It says, then Philip. Now, this Philip, we just went through all those names in Acts chapter six, where it listed these men that were chosen to basically step in and, and help these apostles. And these seven men that were chosen, it went through a list of names. It was Stephen, but also there was Philip. OK, that was chosen. So this Philip is talking about that Acts chapter six, Philip, that was uh, then, you know, handpicked during that time. So we get an, an uh, introduction about him. And as I mentioned about Stephen, I would say also about this, this man, Philip here, also known later on as Philip the Evangelist. But Philip here, I believe that Philip also was an apostle um, because of the fact that he did miracles. And when you read through the Bible, it, you will see that in these uh, in these uh, in the New Testament scriptures, when it came to uh, the people that were able to do miracles, it wasn't just your average saved person who could do miracles. It was given to specific people to do miracles. And notice what it said about Philip. Verse five. Then Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ unto them and the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. 
So notice before, excuse me, notice after he's chosen, the Bible records that this man now does miracles. And that's why I believe that he was uh, an apostle because these miracles were given to uh, the apostles. If you you can turn if you want. But second Corinthians chapter 12, Paul writes to the church of Corinth. He says, I am become a fool in glory. Ye have compelled me for I ought to have been commended of you for and nothing. Am I behind the very chiefest apostles, though I be nothing. Listen clearly. Verse 12. Truly, the signs of an apostle were wrought among you and all patience and signs and wonders and mighty deeds. So notice what he said. The signs of an apostle were in all patience and signs and wonders. This is talking about miracles and mighty deeds. So when you go back to Acts chapter eight, what does it say about Philip? And what did we read about uh, Stephen? If you want to turn it, you don't have to. And Ste with Stephen, we're at Acts chapter six, verse eight. It says, and Stephen full of faith and power did great wonders and miracles among the people. And then hear the same thing about Philip. It says Philip hearing, excuse me, the people uh, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. So that's why I'm convinced that this man, Philip and Stephen were both apostles. OK, so uh, let's pick up in uh, verse seven. It says for, uh, excuse me, actually, let's do verse six again. And the people with one accord gave heed unto those things which Philip spake, hearing and seeing the miracles which he did. For unclean spirits crying with loud voice came out of many that were possessed with them and many taken with palsies and that were lamed were healed. And there were, was great joy in that city. So we see uh, even further the miracles that Philip did. It said he was casting out unclean spirits, uh, many possessed with uh, spirits. And then it says those taken with palsies and that were lamed. He was healing these people. But then the Bible introduces another character in verse nine. It says, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria giving out that himself was some great one to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest saying this man is the great power of God and to him they had regard because that of long time he had bewitched them with sorceries so the Bible brings up this man Simon and it basically the Lord want us to know something quickly about Simon notice it said Simon then it says the same used sorcery. So this guy is a sorcerer. Well, if you ask, what is a sorcerer? Well, this is a guy, this is a person that deals with the dark side. This is a person that deals with a lot of evil spirits, that deals with uh, devils. And the thing is, is that this is also a person who deceives people, is a person who lies to people. And uh, the thing is that this man had a big following. He had a lot of people. He had a big influence on people. Look at verse nine again. It said in the middle of it, it says that um, it says, but there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery and bewitched the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. So this guy's boasting. He's like, hey, I'm the real deal. Like he's boasting about himself. He's giving himself that giving off himself that he's like, hey, I'm I'm legit. You ought to listen to me. And then people did follow him. He had a following. Verse 10 says to whom they all gave heed from the least to the greatest, saying this man is the great power of God. They think that this man is sent from God. But he's really a deceiver. And then verse 11, to whom they had regard, they regarded this man. They had this man in high, you know, in high respects. And then it said he had bewitched them with sorceries. They didn't know, but they thought that this man is a prophet. They think he's sent from God. Right. But on the on the aspect of the real aspect of it, this guy's a deceiver. He's a sorcerer. Turn with me to Exodus chapter seven. Exodus chapter seven. 
we see the very first time the Bible brings up this word sorcery. And we're going to look at how with this and I want to touch on it just because we're going verse by verse. If the Lord thought it important to bring out the fact that this guy's a sorcerer, then we ought to touch on. It. I don't want to just skip over that. You know, that's a big deal. And it's about even see a, we'll see a bigger deal about it once we get back to Acts. But we'll see that here in Exodus chapter seven, the Lord used this word sorcery with some interchangeable words. So whenever we read through the Bible, he may use a different word. But all these these names for sorcery is being lumped together. So here in Exodus chapter seven, this is when Moses goes to Pharaoh and he says, you know, let my people go. The Lord said, let my people go that they may serve me. If you look at Exodus chapter seven, look at verse 10. It said, and Moses and Aaron went in unto Pharaoh and they did so as the Lord command had commanded. And Aaron cast down his rod before Pharaoh and before his servants. And it became a serpent. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. So let me stop right there. A uh, Aaron and Moses throw down their rod. It becomes a serpent. The Bible says Pharaoh called his wise men. But then notice what these wise men are lumped in as. They're lumped in with sorcerers. Now you have to be careful because you don't want to just every time you see wise men just, you know, associate it with a sorcerer. You know, because if you think about it with the Lord Jesus Christ, when he was born, it brings up the fact that they were there was wise men, you know. So you have to make sure that you get the proper context. And I think this is good right here because the Lord lumps these wise men with sorcerers. Not only do he just lump them with sorcerers, but look what else he lump them with. Then Pharaoh also called the wise men and the sorcerers. Now, the magicians of Egypt, they also did like manner with their enchantments. So wait a minute, look at the different words, wise men, sorcerers, magicians, and then enchantments. And sometimes as we're about to see, the Bible would just call these people enchanters. Okay. So then he says, verse 12, for they cast down every man his rod and they became serpents. But Aaron's rod swallowed up their rods. Turn to Deuteronomy chapter 18. Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse uh, nine. This is speaking about when they were to get to that promised land that was promised them. He said in verse nine, when thou art come into the land which the Lord thy God giveth thee, thou shalt not learn to do after the abominations of those nations. There shall not be found among you anyone that maketh his son or, or his daughter to pass through the fire or use a divination or an observer of times or an enchanter. Wait, didn't we just see enchantments? So guess what else is lumped in with enchanters and sorcerers? Well, guess what? A person who uses divination, which is uh, casting spells, dealing with the evil side, dark side, or an observer of times or an enchanter or a witch. Verse 11, or a charmer, or a consultant with familiar spirits, or a wizard, or a necromancer. So we see all these names that are just being lumped in, and God is using them interchangeable. Okay, and the thing is, is that if you consider this person uh, Simon, you know, the sorcerer, guess what? He most likely has all these things attached to him, because God is lumping all these names into just one category. And these are people who just deal with familiar spirits, dealing with devils, dealing with uh, dealing with the evil side. So uh, the thing is, is that we have to be careful because people make light of these things, especially around Halloween. Right. People just, you know, oh, I want to be a witch or, you know, they they're, they're constantly making light of, you know, just sorcery and palm reading and and things like that. And it's the, the fact is that we have to just be careful about that. You know, the Bible brought up the magicians. Notice that the magicians were able to do exactly what Moses did. They was able to, to change it into a serpent, a snake. And, you know, you just think about people like David Blaine, you know, who just, I mean, chewing on glass and swallowing it. And I mean, who does that type of stuff? 
you know, there are all these Las Vegas shows where, you know, they dealing with lions and they overhear it and then you snap a finger. Now they up there in the air like, you know, you all these magicians and, and everything like that. You have to just slow down and consider that these people do what they do because they're deceivers, because they're dealing with the evils. They're dealing with devils. You know, but the Bible, although the world just think that is fun, you know, there is one not too far from my house, uh, a, a new uh, building. It says psychic, you know, and they're just popping up everywhere. You know, I'm like they consider this a business, you know, and the thing is, people make light of it. Oh, it's not that big of a deal. Let's just go see what our future tells and everything. Listen, your future is right here. Read the word of God. Get saved and. and read the word of God. You'll find a lot of uh, what the will of God is for your life. You know, the Bible paints a different story about us, about sorcery. It shows that it's wicked. It shows that, you know, these people are, are dealing with devils. And I remember a couple years back, I was in Barnes and Noble and uh, just walked in. I believe it was around Halloween time and right up front in Barnes and Noble, literally, I'm not lying, probably like from this wall to probably about that, that front door right there, this door that leads out the, uh, the auditorium, whole row of books about how to cast spell on people, how to, you know, deceive someone, how to cast spirits. And these were not kiddie books. I mean, these were thick books, like not for kids, <laughs> like real books, you know? And I'm like, this is real. People take the time to study it out, to print books, they put money into it. You know, and, and we, that's something we just have to be careful about. Let's uh, go back to Acts chapter eight. And like I said, I wanted to just touch on it because the Lord, the Holy Ghost makes it clear that this guy's a sorcerer. He wants us to understand that. Verse 12, it said, but when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God, and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized, both men and women. So notice verse 12, but when they, well, who is they? Well, within our reading, we have changed geographical locations now. We were in Jerusalem. There's been a, a persecution that people have been scattered abroad. And one of them is Philip. Philip now is preaching in Samaria. So there's a change of location. So in verse 12, when they say, but when they believe, this is talking about the people of Samaria now. And, um, it says, when they believed Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized both men and women. So these people, they hear the word of God. They believe the preaching of Philip about the Lord Jesus Christ and they get baptized after that. But not only just them, but look at verse 13. Look who else. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Well, notice how the Bible a few verses earlier points it out that this man Simon is a sorcerer. But now in verse 13, then Simon himself believed. And when he was baptized, he continued with Philip, right? So the Bible points it out that Philip, excuse me, that Simon here who bewitched people who deceived people, who was a sorcerer, who was dealing with devils, who was dealing with the dark side, it said that he believed. He believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. And you know, most people can read this and say, man, this guy, if you just, uh, just seen him in his craft and how he had a whole following and how he was deceiving people, anybody would say, this guy deserves to go to hell. He's deceiving the masses. I mean, people think this guy is of God. And, and you would just say he he just deserved to go to hell. But you know what? This shows that even a demon possessed person can get saved. This shows that God's mercy can even reach that person who has been involved in any type of witchcraft and everything. And you just look at the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ. How many people got healed from demon possession? How many people was, you know, demons were throwing them into the fire and, and trying and trying to drown them in everything? And this happened plenty of times. And guess what? These people got healed. They got saved. Many of them continue to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. What about Mary Magdalene? The Bible says seven devils was driven out of her. And what happened with her? She was one of his closest 
followers. So we have to be careful to just assume that just because this person is dealing with sorcery or the dark side, that you just give up on these people and they, you know, it's done for them. They're, they're bewitching people, they're deceiving people. No, the Bible clearly, we see this over and over that, listen, these people can still get a chance to get saved. And you know, the thing is, if they're gonna get saved, it will not be by Benny Hinn. It will not be by T.D. Jakes with his uh, Pentecostal tongue talk. It will not be, you know, Benny Hinn's walking up and slapping them on the forehead and they touch him and they falling out. It will be none of that. None of these guys is going. It's not going to be Dr. Phil that's going to correct these demon possessed people. We see from the word of God that with the word of God get preached, this is what will get the demon possessed saved. And here it is. Notice that with this guy. Philip doesn't even do a miracle with him. He could have drove out the spirits, but notice what it said. Then Simon himself believed also when he was baptized. Well, the thing is, is that the previous verse spoke about how Philip was preaching to the Samaritans. So what is it? He didn't get saved because some, uh, you know, because demons fleed him or anything like that. No, he heard the word of God and he believed it and he got saved. Philip didn't even have to drive out any miracles. Just the word of God was good enough. And I think that's the same for today, that if we are going to get someone saved who's dealing with this dark side and dealing with sorcery, guess what it's going to take? It's going to take the word of God. We don't have to try to pull in any type of science or anything. Listen, this word of God is powerful. It's sharper than any two edged sword. So it should be handled the same exact way. And you know what? There's this um, there is this, I would say, tendency when you see people because today you kind of spot them when you see them of people who's like dealing with the dark side. For some reason, they all dress alike. They like the black nails, the all black, jet black hair, black lips. They put the black, you know, lip gloss on, whatever, lipstick. They like to wear all black. Every single shirt has death on it, you know, people with the, having a, a, a noose around their neck or something crazy like that, a Slayer t-shirt. It, it, you just look at them and you just say, yeah, that person is dealing with something wicked. And the tendency is basically to say they're not going to be receptive of the gospel. They're not going to want to hear this. But you know what? You just never know what that person is going through. You this that could just be the day that could be the day that they could get saved. So we can't just assume just because how a person is dressed that they're not going to be receptive to it. You know, just because there's some heavy metal or maybe some hip hop, you know, wearing clothes, pants sagging and everything like that. You just assume they're not going to be receptive to this. We have to give them an opportunity right. as well. So look at uh, verse 14 after Philip had uh, believed. Verse 14 says, now when the apostles which were at Jerusalem heard that Samaria had received the word of God, they sent unto them Peter and John, who when they were come down, prayed for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. So this is interesting that once John and Peter they hear that, you know, Philip has done the work down there in Samaria. They decide that they're going to come down so they can. And what's interesting is that if you remember verse one, how it ended, it ended in verse one with three words that, you know, everybody was scattered abroad. But verse one says, except the apostles. So John and these guys, John and Peter, they stayed in Jerusalem. And remember, they had this thing about. You know, like as they told Paul, you know, you be the apostles of the Gentiles and we'll stay here to the, you know, to the Jews. They had this thing about going out and preaching to Gentiles. And, you know, it wasn't that just Paul should be the apostles of the Gentiles. No, God told them to go everywhere. He wanted them to do the same. But it's interesting after, you know, he uh, preaches to them, they basically get word that Samaria has received the gospel and then they come down there as well. And then they uh, get to land uh, hands. If I'm not mistaken, if you look at uh, verse uh, 15, it said who when they were come down, pray for them that they might receive the Holy Ghost. For as yet he was falling upon none of them, only they were baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus. Then laid they their hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. 
So <clears throat> I want to touch on the, the, the receiving of the Holy Ghost, because in verse 16, it speaks about how they had the Holy Ghost come upon them. In verse 15, it speaks about how they had not received the Holy Ghost. Now, these people, they had received the Holy Ghost when it comes to the indwelling of the Holy Ghost. But they had not received the Holy Ghost coming upon them. That's why verse 16 says, for as yet he was falling upon none of them. Right. So there is a difference between the Holy Ghost falling upon you and the Holy Ghost indwelling you. OK. So for an example, the Gospel of John, chapter seven, if you want to turn there, you don't have to. But Gospel of John, chapter seven. It says in the verse 37 says in the last day. That great day of the feast, Jesus stood and cried, saying, if any man thirst, let him come unto me and drink. He that believeth on me, as the scripture hath said, out of his belly shall flow rivers of living water. But this spake he of the spirit, which they that believe on him should receive. For the Holy Ghost was not yet given because that Jesus was not yet glorified. So when it speaks about that Jesus had, uh, was not yet glorified, it speaks about his resurrection. It speaks about how he was not resurrected yet. And the thing is, after he was resurrected, that is when the Holy Ghost could come and indwell the believer. Just like after his resurrection, he gets to his disciples and he breathes on them and he says, receive ye the Holy Ghost. Right. But then later on, he tells those same disciples to go into Jerusalem and tarry there until the Holy Ghost come upon them. So it's two separate things. In Acts chapter one, verse eight, he says, but ye shall receive power after that the Holy Ghost is come upon you. So the thing is, the Holy Ghost come upon them would allow them and give them the boldness, give them the utterance to go out and preach the gospel. And he says, and ye shall be witnesses unto me. So the thing is, when the Holy Ghost came upon them, then that would cause them or enable them or embolden them to go out and be a witness for the Lord Jesus Christ. And of course, he's saying all of uh, in both in Jerusalem and in all Judea and in Samaria and unto the uttermost part of the earth. So go back with me to Acts chapter uh, eight. So I just wanted to touch on that because it said that uh, the Holy Ghost was not yet falling upon them. OK, so I wanted to clear that up. We pick up in verse 18. It says, and when Simon saw that through laying on of the apostles hands, the Holy Ghost was given. He offered them money, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, he may receive the Holy Ghost. So Simon here sees that the apostles, uh, Peter and John, are laying hands. And once they lay hands, the Holy Ghost comes upon these people. And the thing is, is that he's just pretty much thrilled and he wants this same power. He wants this same authority to be able to allow the Holy Ghost to come upon uh, these people. And he think that he could obtain this power, obtain this gift by paying for it. He think that he can purchase it with money. And what happens is that Peter rebukes him pretty sharply for this. Look at verse 20. It says, but Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee because thou has thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou has neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is now right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray God, if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in the gall of bitterness and in the bond of iniquity. So Peter here, once he realized what Simon asked for, he's asking for this power and he wants to make a purchase for it. He wants to buy it. Peter lays into him and he just basically rebukes him. He corrects him uh, to let him know that, hey, this cannot be purchased with money. Now, the thing is, as I mentioned at the beginning of the message, there's a lot of dialogue as well just in this chapter. We're going to get into some more later on. But I want to look at this dialogue between this conversation between Peter and Simon here, this guy who just got saved, because we can learn something from their conversation. Now, I don't know if the Holy Spirit was upon Peter when he said this. Uh, the Bible didn't say the Holy Ghost came upon Peter and he opened up his mouth and said, you know, but I think the bottom line is that Peter is right. You know, this is nothing that you can buy with money. 
you know, this is just something that God has ordained for the believers that the Holy Ghost should come upon them. Right. So I don't know if this is, you know, the Holy Ghost coming upon him. But as I mentioned, he's right, though, for rebuking him and he's right in his answer towards him. But I want to look at the conversation and what we can learn from this. Number one, what we can learn from here from this is that we have to remember that newly saved people are babes in Christ. Newly saved people are babes in Christ. You have to consider something. You have Peter who has been for one. We can at least give him probably three and a half years of walking with the Lord Jesus Christ. So at least give this man at least three plus years of being saved. Then you got on the other hand, this guy, Simon, who just got saved a couple, probably a couple days ago. I don't I don't know. But some hours ago, <laughs> pretty much, he just got saved. Now, here's the thing. We have to expect Simon to still be worldly, Amen. if that makes sense. Yeah. We have to expect him to have a worldly mentality. We have to expect him to still kind of convert back to his old ways or think how he used to do. He was a sorcerer. He hustled people out of money. He made a living by just getting money from people. He made a living by deceiving people. He still has this mentality, though he's saved. So we have to consider that although he's saved, he still has a tendency to go back and do things in his old lifestyle or so, if that makes sense. OK, so the thing is, when considering newly saved people, we have to understand the Bible says that Jesus Christ, it says he came unto his own and his own received him not. But as many as received him to them, gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. So those who believe on his name, guess what they are? They become the sons of God. Right. You were not always a son of God, but when you believed on Christ, you became a son or a daughter of God, right? You became a child of God. So the thing is, when we become sons, when we become daughters of God, we don't just start out as this just mature Christian. Does that make sense? Just like when you're born into this world, you're not just born as an adult. It takes time to reach adult stage. It takes years. Right. So we have to consider that that it's the same thing with a newly saved person. It's going to take time for growth. It may take years. We're supposed to constantly just grow pretty much until the day we leave here. We ought to be adding to our faith. Right. So the thing is, we have to take that approach that when someone is newly saved, you have to give them time to grow. The Bible says that in Proverbs chapter 22, verse 15, it says foolishness is bound in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. Now, if you look at it in the physical sense of that, if you have a child, guess what? It's a lot of foolishness bound in the heart of that child. And the Bible is saying that the rod of correction shall drive it far from him. But as a secondary application here, that can also apply for a spiritual babe in Christ, a spiritual son or daughter in Christ. That guess what? When they get saved, guess what? They have a lot left in them. A lot of the world's foolishness, a lot of that old life that they had, a lot of sin that, you know, they have not gotten out of their life yet, but they're saved. Right. So guess what? Just as foolishness is bound in the heart of that physical child, their spiritual child of God. Guess what? They're going to have in their hearts too. still a lot of foolishness that is still there. But guess just but guess what? Uh, excuse me. Guess what will, you know, drive that foolishness out of that spiritual baby in Christ's heart? The word of God. Amen. You get the foolishness out of your heart by getting in the word of God. First Peter chapter two, verse two says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby. So notice what he said as newborn babes, just like you, just like a newborn baby. And we got a lot of those around here. Right. Those babies be craving milk. And why? Because they're hungry. They want to grow. But in the same way, the spiritual baby in Christ, they ought to feast for the word of God, just like a, a baby 
craves that milk. So he says, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word. So that Christian that's newly saved ought to desire that sincere milk of the word so they can get that foolishness out of their life. So we have to remember, number one, that newly saved people, they're babes in Christ. You have to be patient with people when they're not, you know, up to par and when they're they're not growing here. Uh, number two, actually, that's exactly where I was going. Number two, we have to remember to be patient with new believers. Be patient with them. As I mentioned, Simon just got saved. We're in the same chapter here. I don't know how many hours, how many days, but the man just got saved, right? I don't know how long he's been saved, but he just recently got saved. And I heard a lot of people, because what Simon said, when he's like, you know, uh, give me, yeah, he's trying to pay them money for the power to lay, you know, lay hands on them and the, the power of God to come down upon them. I hear a lot of people say, and I heard this many messages, that Simon really didn't get saved. They will say that, you know, he's a fake convert because of what he did here, because of what he said. Well, I'm going to go with what the Holy Ghost said. Verse 13, the Bible said, then Simon himself believed. That's salvation right there. I'm going to take the fact that verse 12 says that Philip is preaching to everybody. And verse 13 says even Simon, the sorcerer, this guy, he even believed. Right there is where that man got saved. And then he, after he got saved, he, he, uh, he got baptized and he continued with Philip. So I'm going to go with what the Bible says here and says that this man, Simon, got saved. <clears throat> now, here's the thing. Simon, he's saved. And a lot of people I heard say he's not saved because of some of his struggles. He's still struggling with, you know, the sorcery end of things. He's still trying to deceive people. This is evidence. This is the proof. This is look at his work. This is proof that the guy didn't get saved. That's what a lot of people will say. But here's the thing. He's a new creature in Christ. Yeah. But guess what? This guy is walking in the old man. He's not walking in the new man. He's walking in the old man. Right. So the thing is, just because he is seeking to get this power by paying for it, just because he's kind of converting back to his old way of thinking. You can't just say this guy didn't get saved. Although a lot of people, you know, teach that and everything. And we have to, as I mentioned here, we just have to be careful. We have to be patient with people be patient with newly saved people when they're not growing as fast as you are, when they don't have the language down pat, when they don't have the scripture down pat, when they slip up and say something that's contrary to scripture. I mean, when they just got saved last week, last last month, you, you just think that they're going to have it down pat and they say something wrong. Something that's totally wrong and people I, I doubt they even I doubt they even really got saved. A lot of people just write them off. Because of what, you know, they because they don't have it down pat. Be patient with people. Allow them to grow in their spiritual walk. I heard people say, you know, how many times have we heard this? If you're still struggling with sin, I doubt you got saved. You supposed to have gotten saved and you're still struggling with pornography. You're still struggling with drinking. You're not paying your tithes. You're not soul winning. You're not coming to church. You have you got no one saved. I, I doubt you even got saved. You need to come to this altar right now. You need to get right with God. I mean, you hear it all the time, you know, and, and it's just like, how about you just show some grace, show some mercy on someone, you know, just because they don't have it all together yet. So we have to be patient with people. And notice what I like about this conversation between Peter and Philip here. Excuse me, between uh, between Philip and Simon. Notice that although Peter chews him out, although he rebukes him, he corrects him. Notice one thing he never says. I doubt you even got saved. He never says that. He never say, you know what he said in uh and in verse 21, he says, thy heart is not right in the sight of God. He didn't say, I doubt you even got saved. Verse 22, repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness and pray God. He never said, hey, I doubt. Hey, uh, Philip, you sure you preach to this guy? He didn't say any of that. He just rebuked him and said, hey, you need to get right with God. This is not this is not your old life. 
Hey, none way correcting him and telling him to get that sin out of your life. But nowhere, shape or form did he say, hey, I doubt you even got saved, man. He didn't say that. But thirdly here with this conversation and we're going to move on is that we can learn from this conversation. We can learn that we ought to pray for our converts. Pray for our converts. Look at verse 24. Notice after uh, Peter chews him out. Notice his response. Verse 24. Then answered Simon and said, pray ye to the Lord for me. That none of these things which ye have spoken come upon me. His response after getting chewed out was pray for me. I mean, what a good response. And, you know, what a wake up call. When people just don't have it right, they newly saved. Instead of just casting these people as just unsaved because they don't have the right slang or the right terms and, and the right scripture. Instead of casting them, how about you just pray for them? And that's what Simon was asking. How about you pray for me? And, what, and that's what we should do with our converts. Pray that they start walking after the Lord's ways. Pray that they get the sin out of their life. Pray that they start reading their Bible. Pray that they can start coming to church. And of course, make an effort on our end to follow up. So, you know, to try to urge them the importance of getting in church and getting baptized and everything. Yes, absolutely do that. But at the same time, pray for them. Just like Simon asked Peter, pray for me. Let's pick up in verse uh, 25. <clears throat> It says, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem. Now, this is talking about uh, John and uh, Peter. It says, and they, when they had testified and preached the word of the Lord, returned to Jerusalem and preached the gospel in many villages of the Samaritans. And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go toward the south unto the way that go down from Jerusalem unto Gaza, which is desert. And he arose and went and behold, a man of Ethiopia and the eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who had charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem for to worship, was returning and sitting in his chariot, read Isaiah the prophet. So this man here, it says that he's he has great authority. He is under Candace, uh, who is the queen of the Ethiopians. And the thing is, is that the Bible mentions that this man is is uh, in great authority and notice what he's doing. He's reading the word of God. And I just thought that was interesting that this is a man who is under great authority and he's taking the time to read the word of God. And, you know, today it's, it's rare to see people who are in higher ups. And maybe it's some type of exec level or some type of president or some type of king or vice president. It's rare you see these people really having a sincere heart after God. They get up and say these generic prayers. You know, God bless America. They read from these, you know, tainted scriptures and everything. And, and you know, these these prayers, you could tell that they've been read. They've been written out. They've been approved by about 20 people, <laughs> you know, and. You know, you just know that it's fake. But praise God for a man who has great authority, who had charge, uh, you know, under uh, under under Candace, the queen of Ethiopians. And this guy said he's just trying to read the word of God. He's sincere. Verse uh, 29, it says, then the spirit said unto Philip, go near and join thyself to this chariot. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, understand is what thou readest. So the Holy Ghost tells Philip, go and join. I mean, look at those words. I really like this verse because it is so powerful. Go near and join. And, you know, that is our mission today. That is what the Lord want us to do. He want us to go near and join. It is our responsibility. And you get most churches. What are they trying to do? They're trying to work up everything to get the outsiders, to get the world to join unto them. When the reverse should be, no, the church go out and join itself to the lost. And, you know, and that's what the Lord want us uh, to do. So he has given us the ministry of reconciliation. He has not given the lost to reconcile themselves to us, to reconcile themselves unto the Lord. No, he has committed to us the ministry of reconciliation. Verse 30 and 31. He's uh, no, I'm sorry. Yeah, verse 30 and 31 says, And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said, Understandest thou what thou readest? And he said, How can I accept some man should guide me? And he desired Philip that he would come up 
and sit with him. And this here is just pretty much evidence that the unsaved cannot read the word of God. You know, I, I know that sometimes doing so in and we tell people, you know, read these scriptures and, you know, say this prayer, you know, and you will get it doesn't work that way unless that person has had the word of God sown into them many times. But a person just sitting down on their own trying to read the word of God. And I've heard people tell me this before that, you know, I, I'll do this on my own. I'll read it. And, you know, I can call upon and I have to explain to them, listen, it's not going to work that way. You're not going to get it. God has ordained that someone go out and preach the gospel. And how shall they preach it? that they be sent. Right. So God has ordained that someone go and join themselves to that person and preach the gospel to them. So even this man here just confesses and say, hey, I can't understand the word of God. And that's what the word of God is saying, that the un the unsaved person cannot understand the word of God. First Corinthians 2, 14. But the natural man receiveth not the things of the spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. Verse 32 says the place of the scripture which he read was this. He was led as a sheep to the slaughter and like a lamb dumb before his shearer. So opened he not his mouth in his humiliation. His judgment was taken away. And who shall declare his generation for his life is taken from the earth? For his life is taken from the earth. And the eunuch answered Philip and said, I pray thee, of whom speaketh the prophet this, of himself or some other man? Then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. So we're dealing with another conversation, right, between this lost man, this unsaved Ethiopian, and then <coughs> Philip, right, the evangelist, Philip the preacher. And notice the, the unsaved guy, because he can't understand the word of God, he's asking, who is he talking about? He's talking about himself or is he, you know, is he talking about another man? And then he basically just tells him in verse 35 that he preached to him Jesus Christ. Well, that should answer who Isaiah 53. And when you go back through these scriptures that he read, these scriptures are in Isaiah chapter 53. And notice that verse 35 said he began at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus, which means that although people try to deny Isaiah 53, the Jews would try to deny Isaiah 53 and say that's not about Jesus. I'm going to go with what the Holy Ghost said, with what the Bible says. And it says that he preached unto him Jesus. That scriptures are clearly talking about the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ, which were, you know, Isaiah was prophesying that years in advance. It was talking about the torment, the torture that he will go through for our sins. But not only do we get that in this conversation, but we also get the fact that salvation, uh, excuse me, we also get, get a look at how salvation was preached in the Old Testament. Because if you look at it, this story here is recorded after the resurrection of Christ. But although this story here is a New Testament story, they did not have the New Testament scriptures. Does that make sense? They didn't have Matthew through Revelation yet. So all they had was that Genesis through Malachi. That is what they had. So when someone was going to get saved in the Old Testament or even in the New Testament before all this was pinned down, because Acts chapter these books in Acts, all this is, is getting recorded as it's going on. So th these books were not completed yet. So the thing is, is that when a person was going to get saved in the Old Testament, they were saved by the Old Testament scriptures. That is what and notice what he's using. Isaiah. He's using Isaiah and that makes perfect sense as to how a person was saved in the Old Testament. Guess why? Because even the Old Testament scriptures, the prophets, they were all speaking about the Lord Jesus Christ. So that's why Philip here could pick up, although he didn't have the Romans road, although he didn't have Revelation, you know, 21, 8. He had the book of uh, Isaiah and he started at the same scripture and preached unto him Jesus. The Bible says to him, give all the prophets witness. Well, who is to him? The Lord Jesus Christ. To him, give all the prophets witness that through his name, whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins. So guess what? The Old Testament scriptures were good enough to get someone saved. But then also lastly here, 
with this conversation, we see that it we see that it pays to have the right word of God. It pays to have, you know, the incorruptible word of God. You say, what are you talking about? Well, notice that verse 35 says, then Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. So which means when he came into that man's chariot, the man Philip could literally take his Bible, take his word and start at the same scripture and preach to him Jesus. Notice he didn't have to say, what Bible version is this? It said he started at the same scripture, which means the man had the right word of God. And, you know, a lot of people, I'm sure you guys been out so many people where well, I have a question or they'll try to. Well, let me tell you what my Bible say. I, I, I think I have this right. Let me show you what I think. And they say, let me go get my Bible. You say, OK, you wait there. And they come out with like an NIV. and You're like, oh, man, like. But it helps when somebody got the right word of God already. If someone come out and they got a King James, you say, man, praise God. And on the inside, like, hey, man, he got the right word. We, we halfway there already. And notice this man here. It, it said Philip began at the same scripture. And you know what? It, it's, Paul speaks about how they were corrupting the word of God in his day. Right. And we seen in Genesis where Satan was corrupting it back then. In my opinion, I, I believe that even during these days, there was people corrupting the word of God. There was, there was a false version out there. That's just my personal belief. I guarantee that, though. But praise God that this man, could, Philip, could start at the same scripture. You know, and let's go ahead and close this out. Uh, verse 36, it says, and they went on their way. And as they went on their way, they came unto a certain water and the eunuch said, see, here is water. What doth hinder me to be baptized? And Philip said, if thou believest with all thine heart, thou mayest. And he answered and said, I believe that Jesus is the son of God. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch, and he baptized him. I think what we can get from here from the conversation is that it is important in the presentation of the gospel to make sure you bring up baptism because you can tell from the scripture the fact that the eunuch asked about baptism that it was brought up and you know that is something that you know we can often because of time maybe because we're not just really locked in we can tend to forget to bring up baptism and urge that person to you know follow the lord and uh baptism but we see some doctrines about baptism in here that the fact that the prerequisite to getting baptized was to believe and we know I'm not even going to touch the modern versions, how they totally remove this. According to those versions, you don't have to do anything. You just get baptized. Right. But uh, here we just see that believing is the prerequisite. And we see that salvation clearly is just by believing, just by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, three times in this one chapter, I don't know if you all caught on to it, but we see a person believing on Christ and then they're baptized right after. We've seen it three times. One right here, where we at? The Ethiopian eunuch and Philip, right? He has to believe and then he's baptized. But then what about verse 12? But when they believe, talk about the people of Samaria, when they believe the preaching, uh, when they believe Philip preaching the things concerning the kingdom of God and the name of Jesus Christ, they were baptized. But then the next verse as well. Then Simon himself believed also. And when he was baptized, right? So three times just in this one chapter, we see the proper order, believing first and then baptism. Right. And let's turn to Mark chapter 16. This is one of the last verses I'll turn you to, because this is a often, uh, you know, misunderstood scripture. People take it as a scripture and uh, they want to twist it and, you know, teach a heresy out of it that you must be baptized in order to get saved. If you look at Mark chapter 16, verse 15, it says, And he said unto them, Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I think clearly that this is clearly just talking about what the will of God is for that newly saved person. That the newly saved person, once someone goes out and preach the gospel to them, here is what he wants. He said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. The will of God for a Christian, for a saved person is not only to just get saved and then that's just it. You don't do anything else. No, the will of God is that you also follow him in baptism. And I think that is clearly what he's saying, because the emphasis is on 
believing because look at the remainder of the verse. But he that believeth not shall be damned. So look at what he said. He that believeth and is baptized. I think that is clearly just talking about the will of God and the proper order of how this should go. As we just pointed out three times in this one chapter, believe, then baptize, believe, then baptize, believe and baptize. We see it played out in these stories. And then one of our most famous scriptures that we turn to, what must I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. If you read the remainder of the chapter, the Bible says that Paul preached the gospel to that man and his family and immediately they were baptized. That is the will of God. And I believe uh, wholeheartedly that that is what Mark is talking about. But look at the emphasis that but he that believeth not shall be damned. Now, I can see if it said he that believeth not and is not baptized shall be damned. It didn't say that. It says, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Sound like John 3, 18. He that believeth on him, excuse, he that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten son of God. So what condemns is the person is the person who does not believe. The person who believes is not condemned. So I think that's clearly talking about the same thing here. And the will of God is for a person to believe and then get baptized. But let's close it out here in um, Acts chapter eight. This is the last scripture we're going to look at. Uh, verse 38 through 40 says, but excuse me. And he commanded the chariot to stand still. And they went down both into the water, both Philip and the eunuch. And he baptized him. And when they were come up out of the water, the spirit of the Lord called away Philip that the eunuch saw him no more. And he went on his way rejoicing. But Philip was found at Azotos and passing through. He preached in all the cities till he came to Caesarea. And, you know, this this you could have just did a message and titled this thing. The Chronicles of Philip. Right. Because this man is just a preaching machine. Right. The Lord is, uh, is putting him everywhere and everywhere he goes. He's just preaching the word of God. It said that the spirit took him from this place and took him over there. And basically he was found preaching over there as well. This guy's just a preaching machine. And I think it's a good testament that no matter where we go, we ought to look for opportunities to just preach the word of God. You know, and there's people all anywhere and everywhere who need the word of God, who need to be saved. So um, let's have a word of prayer as we were going through this book of Acts. Uh, um, pray that we learn much from it and let's make some good applications from these, all right? Lord God, we thank you for your word this day and uh, pray, Lord, that we will um, uh, just uh, add these words and examples to our daily lives, Lord, to be patient with people, Lord, and new believers, Father, and look to get people saved, Father, and um, do all that we do to the glory of your name, Father. In Jesus' name, amen.